Hey, this is W. Kamal Bell, and you're watching Comedy Matters TV. Shout out to SiriusXM. Ting. <laughs> hey, it's Jeffrey Gurian here for Comedy Matters TV and SiriusXM, and I'm backstage at the Fillmore during the South Beach Comedy Festival with Kamal Bell. How are you, man? Uh, good. I'm doing great, Jeffrey. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, it was great to see you tonight. You killed it, man. It was a great show. Uh, yeah, I'm working on it. You know, I'm, I'm taping a special later this year, so this is the the hard uh, part of the going to the gym and trying to lift the weights. Yeah, Chris Rock, I think, called it a gym yeah. you know, a long time ago. He said it's like working out for comedians. It's the only thing you could do, man. It's just yeah. like, it's hard work. Yeah. Breaking stuff in. Especially yeah. for a big show. Did you use new material tonight? A lot, anything new? Or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been, I'm sort of for, forcing myself to try new things. So there's, a, there's just little, you know, and I also talked about Miami and I hadn't talked about that stuff before. So yeah, I'm just, whenever I go to a new city, I try to sort of like let them know I know where I'm at and sort of like see what I can do, get out of that. Well, I was going to say, people talk about you as a political comedian, but you do a lot of other stuff as well. It's not strictly politics. Like Mort Saul used to be known as a political comedian. Yeah. You know, but no, and I feel like maybe... Mort Saul maybe actually was a comedian, political comedian, and the rest of us are sort of like, occasionally I talk about, you know, because even like Lewis Black is a political comedian, but he talks about, you know, he's got a great bit about water bottles, but. About other stuff, yeah. yeah. I was very glad that you, uh, like, it's so funny that people are knocking, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's funny how people like to put people in a category. Yes. You know, it, it, people in general. Yeah. They yeah. feel comfortable if they can put someone in a category. And there are certain people who do not fall into a category. No, I, I think that's true. I mean, I feel like for me, when people say you're political, I, I was like, I think you just mean I'm a black guy with an opinion. Exactly. <laughs> like, I think, exactly. That, I think that's your way of going, that black guy has some opinions and he says them out loud a lot. I think that's political. And, you know, and it's interesting that you talked about 12 Years a Slave. Now, I happen not to see it because it's hard for me to see sad things like that. And as you clearly said, is there anybody who any, ha has any doubt that that's a bad thing? You know what I mean? It's like the people who need to see that movie will never see it. That's the problem with things like that. Don't you agree? It's like, yeah. yeah, I mean, I feel, I mean, it's a great movie, but it's certainly, I'm just so shocked by the number of people who are like, oh my goodness, That's slavery was bad. <laughs> that was really hard. Like, I'm just like, it's like, are there people who are on the fence about yeah, that? It's like, okay. yeah, it's like, I can't see Holocaust movies because it's too sad. Being Jewish, it's yeah. very hard for me to watch. The Holocaust was a sad thing. You don't need anything to confirm that for you. But the crazy thing is that there are people who deny the Holocaust. At least no one denies slavery. Yeah, no, no, they just do the thing where like, I think black people liked it. I think there's a lot of that. Oh, yeah. That's kind of, that's yeah. almost the same as denying slavery. Yeah, yeah. They, because or the Holocaust, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, deny the Holocaust. Yeah, because I mean, there are actual Holocaust deniers yeah, yeah. who are proud to say that. I mean, there's not people standing up. You know why? Because black people will kill them. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah. It's t generally, they only say slavery was good for black people in rooms that don't have black people in them. Because exactly. even if black guy's the waiter, your food's going to have a lot of human fluids in it. <laughs> exactly. yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a hard, it's a hard thing to, to press forward on. So, um, you know, I was at your show a couple of times, Totally Biased. Yes. And even that's an interesting title. I don't think you're totally biased. I think you're open to both sides, to listening, yeah. you know, but you have opinions. I just think when I do have an opinion about things that I sort of go, oh, I believe in this, there's just no way you're going to talk me out of it. Like, nobody's going to be, nobody's going to present evidence that marriage equality is a bad thing. Nobody, I'm like, huh, yeah. what? Well, you know what? I never really looked at those statistics before. Nobody's going to, I'm totally biased about that thing. Nobody's going to present evidence that we shouldn't uh, fix our immigration policies. Oh, you know what? Yeah, these Mexicans aren't helping. You know, like there's no, there's just things that I am totally biased about. But what I remember though, and I thought it was very cool, that one of the days that I was there, you had a black Republican on. Oh yeah, that was an early show. Yeah, it was an early show. And, and, and I thought it was very cool because you allowed him to express himself because a black Republican is kind of rare. You know, you don't see it a lot. Yeah. And it, it would be very easy to ignore that element of the population, yeah. but you gave him his say. And I yeah. think, and that's very cool. That's what it's supposed to be about, that's about people being allowed to say what they feel with intelligence. Well, I'm entering the awkward conversation era of my career. And so that's what I feel like. I'm trying to promote awkward conversations because that's where you get the real change. When you actually sit down with somebody where it's like, I don't agree with you, you don't agree with me, but let's talk and see if we can get to a new place as opposed to like, I don't agree with you, you don't agree with me. I got to kill you or I got to vote against you. Or I got to, yeah, yeah. I got to. can't be on my show. And you got to move out of my neighborhood.
neighborhood. And it's just like, no, that doesn't, that's not going to get anywhere. So I'm, I'm a fan. Totally Bias was sort of leaning in that direction. And so even though the show's canceled, I'm still promoting the art of awkward conversations. Well, and there was no yelling. It was an, it was an, it was an even exchange of information, yeah. which intelligent people can do without yelling at each other. You could say, this is how I feel, and that's fine, and you're allowed to have your opinion. Yeah. You know? So what do you think happened with the show? I mean, it was a good show. What do you think? I mean, I think, I mean, I, ultimately the, the blame has to fall on me. <laughs> like, I feel like I can't, I can't totally parse out the blame. Like, well, it was 6% this. And I mean, I think I was still getting my sea legs with having a daily television show, which is a hard thing. And I didn't have any experience even working a television show before. So I think that the adjustment was probably, you know, it wasn't happening as quick as they wanted to. And I think we went from FX and we went to FXX and I regularly heard from people that they didn't know how to get us or couldn't get us or mm -hmm. people were like, I'm not paying 30 extra dollars for that cable channel. I'm like, look, mom, if you're not going to pay, yeah, just, right. you don't got to tell me, <laughs> right. you know? So it's like, I think, exactly. but I ultimately the blame falls on me. I mean, FX, the fact that they gave me a show has changed my career. They could have not given me a show, oh, you know, absolutely. like I, it wasn't just my turn. It was just like they, oh, yeah, they took right. a chance. Exactly. I think well, they got a lot of good press out of it and they, we, we helped each other for as long as we could. And then it's owned by Fox. It's a huge corporation. I'm a line item on a 400 page document on Rupert Murdoch's assistance, assistance, assistance desk, you know? So I think it's somewhere they went, that's not really doing what we needed to do, so. Yeah. But I like the fact that Chris Rock picked you out. From what I remember you telling me, you were a stand-up comic. You were just performing like, I don't know about obscurity, but he picked you out. I was, I was, like, yeah, 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 I was, yeah, I was obscure. I mean, basically, to Chris Rock, if you can't headline Madison Square Garden, you're in obscurity. Yeah, in obscurity. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, you're, you're not so, until you play the big, big room. You're, it's all obscurity. So. And so, so he was in the audience when you were performing. Tell me that story, because I, I, I love stuff like that. He was. Uh, I was doing a, at a one man show called the W Come Out Bell Curve, ending racism in about an hour, mm -hmm. uh, where if you brought a friend of a different race, you got in two for one. Oh, yeah. That's absolutely true. Yeah, not even Martin Luther King Jr. did that, but of course he also didn't charge admission. Uh, so I had been doing that show for several years. It was a comedy show, much like Totally Bias, but it was just topical and about racism. And it was about an hour long show. And then I was doing it in the Bay Area for a long time. Took it to L.A. Took it to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Took it around the country. And I took it to New York to several different festivals there: the Fringe Festival and Solo Nova. And then finally, I just I did it at UCB Theater one night, just sort of on a trying to keep my name out there and get mm -hmm. people out there. Yeah. And it was a great show and after the show Chris Rock floats backstage dressed in black like you know him to of be course, yeah. with the, with the hat on his secret yeah. identity hat you know like so the this motherfucker with the hat hat yeah yeah yes yes yeah. and he came back and he and I never met him before and it was just like you know suddenly you're standing in front of like a Jedi and you're like he's like yeah it was good and you know because people like to think that he was probably like this is finally I've met the one it wasn't like the Matrix it was like like Michael Jordan going your jump shot's good but are you gonna work on your defense like you know like it's so he was like you need to move and then he called me a few months later and he uh said he wanted to help me get a tv show so he took your number that night and he, he said actually, no he doesn't take your number he just gets your number okay. <laughs> yeah, I, got, yeah. I got a call from an unlisted number and i didn't bother asking him hey where'd you get my number yeah, right, but exactly. i mean there's a guy there is a guy named, enraged yeah, the enraged. nerve of him to How call dare you. you call me from an unlisted number yeah, exactly. chris rock yeah. Yeah, no yeah. and and well a guy who was the one of the who was the executive producer of the show one of the executive producers on the show chuck sklar has worked with chris for years so I'm pretty sure uh -huh. he got it from Chuck. And so yeah. Chuck had been sort of helping me out and was helping me sort of get the show to the next place. And had, I think he told Chris about me. And then another one of Chris's friends, Jocelyn Cooper, who he grew up with, told him about me. And I think he said those two people, he felt like if they, two people he trusted said, you got to check this guy out, he should check me out. So, mm -hmm. you know, and we're still, I mean, no matter what happens, I got like uh, two years of mentorship with one of the greatest comedy minds in the history of comedy. Absolutely. It just also happened to be on a television show. And we're, you know, he's still, every now and again, I get a message from him. And, you know, he's, when he sees me on TV, he goes, that was good. Or, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, he's very honest, as you know. Yes, and, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, I feel like he, I will, he will always be in my corner. Well, having him tell me the story of how Eddie discovered him and for my book was very exciting for him to relive that. Yeah. You know, when, when he was 19 years old and Eddie came into the club and he's like, are there any black comics I could see? And the only one there was Chris Rock, 19, cleaning up the club in exchange for stage time. Yeah. And, that, and then that night made his career. He, they put him on stage to a packed audience. He had never performed before and killed it. 
exactly. and killed yeah, it. Yeah, you know, it's a, so, so, I think he respects that people need help sometimes. And so I think he's helped a lot of people. I was probably the most public person he helped, but I think he, he's at the phase of his career. I feel like he's like in the, uh, the Dr. Dre discovering Eminem phase of his career. Like, you know, there's, I can, there's easier ways to make the show business thing happen than me having to be the face of everything all the time. So, so what's up for you now? What are you working on now? Your, your, your act that you're touring with? Yeah, you, I'm this, touring this, with this act, the Oh Everything Tour. And uh, at the end of the year, I will be recording a comedy special and uh, that because I have never recorded a proper comedy special so this is time, what man. what we worked on tonight it's what me and you in the audience we worked on I'm I'm in the lab trying to uh, polish it up well I know it's gonna be great it was great to see you brother thanks Jeffrey really awesome awesome absolutely